after the commercial. Welcome to our Sankofa seminar on Nigerian history from one to CE. I'm Dr. Clyde Ledbetter. This is our second course in our year. So we started last uh, month, or not last month, we started in July with our course, uh, well, African history from 10,000 BCE to 711. Now this is our second course seminar that will go from today to October 1st, which is Nigerian independence, 62 years of independence, Saturday, October 1st. So this is a, in this seminar, we try to uh, mix in uh, seminars on specific topics in between of our, which are African history part one, our She Rose class, which starts in October. Uh, which starts in January, and then in uh, May, we have early history in our academic year. So welcome, uh, the, we are BIA Media Studios here at 235 Montreal Road, and so we're glad to be operating from here as well. Uh, Okay, I'm getting used to the camera set up here. So this is why we're, we're, and we're messing around with things. We're getting better each week. This is gonna look better each week. Uh, so we're glad that you're staying with us and Zoom or you're watching us on Facebook or you're watching us on YouTube, welcome. And we look forward to the next four weeks. So this seminar is gonna be a little bit different for the first this seminar with another person who's familiar to those that have been attending our classes. I'll be coping uh, with Daniel Roberts III. He's been my teaching assistant for the past two years and now is co-teaching a class with me. Soon he'll be teaching his own classes. So I got to get his knowledge <laughs> while I stay on the bigger and better things. Uh, and he is a burgeoning expert the uh, Yoruba history and other histories of Africa as well, as well as writing a, a, a very important figure, but I'll let him talk more about himself a little bit later. But we're co-teaching this class. He's uh, uh, really, really encourages young teaching. So we're moving you to the next step. All right, this class, E to 1800 CE. Let me get the. Uh... All right. Course learning objectives or seminar learning objectives. What we're going to. By the end of this seminar, you all should be able to. If I do my job right, if Daniel does his job, 
Nigerian history. That's primary. We're going to talk a little bit about that today while we're even studying it. This is an evidence used to recount the development of the peoples in the between 1000 C. Three, you'll be able to recall major events, polities, um, cultural practices. 800 year time period. And when me and Daniel were designing this course, we picked this time period for what we're going to talk about. With the exception of a little bit of the conversation today, most of what we're going to talk about for African conversations. We wanted to avo avoid the time period possible. Why? Because we need to get in the habit of teaching our history without thinking we have to connect it to slavery. Most of that. Most of African history took place without slavery or colonialism, without even the presence. It was very uh, intentional why we chose this time period. And you'll see that as the we What we're going to talk about today, we're going to go over why exactly we're studying this topic. We're going to talk about the sources of this time period. We're going to talk about historical evidence. And we're going to talk about uh, how your to uh, recall the history uh, of, and the importance of Ila Ife about today. So sometimes you'll see maps like this, which is in empires in Africa. And this is a good introductory map. It shows you some the classical Egypt, Kemet, you know, Kush, Ethiopia, um, you know, uh, on and so forth. But when you look at what's now Nigeria, you just see a big thing that just says Yoruba. That doesn't really tell you much. Nigeria. It doesn't really give you much. It's a language and a, a cultural base. So, the cultural and political and social history of this part. I looked before I started this class. There is no course that you can take. None. I looked. In universities in Canada, you would be lucky to have a class just on West African history that covers this entire region in one course. Sometimes in universities in Canada, you only get a course on African history or one course on pre-colonial African history. And then the rest is just dealing with uh, European invasions and things like that. So we want to change that. And this seminar is the first one of hopefully many that we can do to kind of change that, uh, that narrative. We want to create these courses, have them available, the recordings of these lectures. There's also a course website associated with this class that I will send to all of you that have registered uh, on the Zoom. And anyone else that, that needs it, we'll put it on uh, the social media pages. And you have access to the materials that we're talking about. Because we don't want you to get in the habit of just listening to presentations and thinking just because I have a PhD, Daniel's about to be a graduate student, that we know what we're talking about. We want you to go into the sources, critically examine them, use them. There'll be some uh, activities on this course website for you to test your knowledge. So really take advantage of it. But why Nigeria? Why did we start with Nigeria? A couple of reasons. One, Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa with over 200 million people. Africa has about 1.2 billion people. Um, so in effect, very close to one in five Africans is a Nigerian. So a huge uh, cultural space, a place of cultural exchange in this political Algamation that we call Nigeria, and I'll get into that in a second as well. You have 250 nations or ethnic groups. We don't like to use the word tribe because tribe is derogatory. Tribe, uh, you know, the Europeans put that on people that they think are less than them. You don't call the English a tribe, even though there's more Europe of people, just Europe of people, than there are people of English descent that are actually fully British. There's way more Europe of people. There's about uh, the last time I checked, how many Yoruba folks are there? I think close to 40 million. Uh, so, yeah, calling the, 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 the Yoruba tribe, what we call the British nation, is kind of, you know, backwards if you really look at it. So that's one of the reasons why, just to share numbers. We have to, we, if you can't say you know 
West African history. You can't say you know African history without knowing what happened in Nigeria. So that's why one of the reasons why we started with Nigeria. Another reason why we started in Nigeria, because just like so many other nations in Africa, it was well connected to other parts of the continent before colonization. Nigeria, uh, what the nations uh, and peoples that would become Nigeria were part of the Western extension of trade routes that went from West Africa all the way to the Nile Valley, all the way to the Kingdom of Aksum in what's now Ethiopia and Eritrea. So this is part of the African narrative, an important part of the African narrative. So we got to know about Nigeria. Now, this is a map that shows you kind of the ethnic composition of Nigeria. Like I said, 250 ethnic groups, over 400 languages spoken in Nigeria. A vast array of cultural diversity and different histories. But I couldn't call the class, if I really wanted to call the class what I wanted to call the class, the title would be a lot longer than Nigerian history, 1000 CE to 1800 CE. I had to do this to get people's attention. Because really what we're talking about is not Nigerian history, because Nigeria as a concept wasn't really created until 1914, um, when we had the coming together of the Northern Protectorate the, and the uh, Southern Protectorate, which itself was a combination of uh, the Lagos Protectorate and the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria. All of these were combined to create Nigeria by the British in 1914. Uh, so it's relatively new, this idea of Nigeria. But I couldn't write the class as the history of the peoples and nations that would one day become the political concept of Nigeria between 1000 and 1800 uh, CE. That's way too long of a title. People will be like, what is, what, is, what is this about? But that's essentially what we're talking about. The folks, the nations that, were cre that existed uh, and, and lived and worked and created in this area that we're now talking about Nigeria. In the north, you got the Hausa states. In the southwest, you got the Yoruba speaking states. In the southeast, you have the Igbo speaking polities. And then all throughout, you have various other nations the Ijao, you got the uh, Ibibio, you got so many other folks throughout this area that we can talk about and that we will try to get into. We're going to spend a lot of time with the big three the House of Fulani, the Yoruba, and the Igbo, but we are going to intersperse talking about the other groups. It's not that we don't think that those, those histories are important, because we do. We only got four weeks. Really, this class should be an entire eight-week course. Maybe we'll develop that one day. And this is just a seminar. So this is just to give you the big highlights for you, don't, for you to go on to do your own research to find information on your own. And hopefully, if I have it my way, I'll get a Nigerian young person one of these days that I can work with, that we can design courses. This is my ultimate goal. This is my long-term goal, is to have young people from different ethnic groups, different nations on the continent and in the diaspora coming together to work, to create courses, to create content concerning African world history. I've already begun working with young people in our Coppin African Teachers Institute, and you've seen some of those young people present. That's the, the, the long-term goal. So this is kind of the start of that. All right, so our evidence that we're going to look at for the next four weeks on Nigerian history comes from a number of different places, each with its drawbacks and benefits. Number one, oral history. Oral history is incredibly rich in Nigeria. North, south, southwest, southeast, central Nigeria, oral history is incredibly prevalent. Oral history is good, it gives us a lot of information, but it only goes back but so far. Luckily, for the time period that we chose, we can get a lot of oral information. So that's one place that we're gonna look at. This is something that needs to be protected. A lot of it has been written down, uh, which is good, but there's still a lot that's out there that has not been written down. So oral history is one of the places that we'll, we'll look at. And you'll hear more about that today with Daniel, about how we can confirm the veracity of oral history, the truthfulness of oral history. Because that's one question people ask, like, well, if it's oral history, it's not written down, how do we know people aren't making stuff up? Well, number one, you can make stuff up <laughs> through writing as well. And we know that from reading European history on Africa. There's a lot of made up stuff, a lot of stuff about aliens and the ancient white people that came to Africa and built things and left. So you can lie in writing just as much as you can lie in oral history. That's number one. But number two, 
there are various ways that we can confirm the veracity of oral tradition. Uh, whether we compare it to other traditions in the same area that all say the same thing, whether we combine it with other sources such as archaeology, the written records, so on and so forth. So there's ways of confirming it. The archaeological evidence, which I'll talk a little bit about today before I turn it over to Daniel. Archaeology is good because it can take us way back. However, the further back we get sometimes with archaeology, the less that we get of the human story. We're getting better at it with the techniques that I'll talk about today. But unlike written history and oral history, um, you don't get a lot of the emotion of the events that happen, the way that they're recorded in oral and written history. But we can learn a lot about uh, uh, the distant, distant past in Nigeria through archaeology. The written record, a lot of it for the time period that we're talking about was written in Arabic or African uh, versions of Arabic, uh, particularly coming out of uh, northern Nigeria, and even other, other Africans writing in Arabic from uh, the Songhai Empire further north in West Africa, uh, and even in Sudan, who are writing African languages in Arabic and giving chronicles of what was going on in that northern Nigeria uh, between the time periods that we're talking about. Then, you know, uh, we can also rely on linguistic evidence, botanical evidence, and genetic evidence as well to reconstruct uh, the history of this time period. So archaeological evidence, very key. This is kind of where we'll start our conversation, because this takes us back the furthest. Um, and this is from uh, a recent excavation at the uh, Nock site, which is still being excavated, which I'll talk about in a second. So the Nock culture, this is prior to the time period that we're talking about. This is almost 2,000 years prior to the time period that we're talking about. But it's an important place to start, because this is really where Nigerian archaeology has its beginning. So the Nock culture existed sometime between 900 BCE and 200 BCE. And we know about this culture from excavations that started in the 1920s. Um, and these are stolen pieces of Nock artwork uh, and, and sculpture that are now in museums in Paris, in the US, in Britain. And there's a lot of stolen African uh, cultural heritage outside of Africa. And that's another conversation that we need to have. But you see these terracottas these uh, earth uh, pottery uh, sculptures that are still preserved. And you can see the intricate details that were placed in them. Beautiful pieces. The Nock culture, one of the earliest iron producing cultures in West Africa, perhaps the oldest iron producing culture in West Africa. The archaeology tells us that through carbon dating, that the Nock culture goes back to even further than what I had on the screen, 1500 BCE. Carbon-14 is really important for archaeology, and I think I've talked about this in, in previous classes. Uh, Carbon-14 is the testing of the decay of a particular isotope of carbon. Let me put on my scientist cap, even though I'm not, <laughs> I'm a political scientist, I'm not a natural scientist. But essentially it's this. Carbon is made up of six protons and six neutrons, which gives it an atomic weight of 12. So regular carbon is carbon-12. Sometimes, however, in the atmosphere, carbon picks up two extra neutrons, which makes it carbon-14. But carbon-14 is radioactive, and it decays. It's, it's an unstable isotope of carbon. But it, for the good thing for historians is it decays at a steady rate. So you know the last time a, something that was organic, whether it's plant matter, whether it's animal matter, that you know synthesizes carbon. You know, we, uh, breathe in oxygen and let out carbon, or plants take in carbon and let out oxygen. We're dealing with this carbon exchange. Anything that's organic that has something to do with carbon, we can test because once it dies, that carbon 14 starts to decay. And it decays at a steady rate for 50,000 years. We can't go past 50,000 years. Um, so, anything like when we look at this image here of these sisters pounding in this uh, piece of pottery, that organic material. It's going to leave residue that later on archaeologists, when they find this pot, can test, and we can figure out how old this pot was for 50,000 years. After 50,000 years, we're, we're, we're not accurate. And we're not going to be accurate. Archaeologists in the future aren't going to be accurate either, because we've messed up the environment so much that the carbon-14, carbon-12 ratios are all off. So future uh, archaeologists aren't going to be able to do this. Uh, but anyway, carbon-14 dating, very important, tells us about this culture, how old it is. 
these terracottas were used for ceremonial purposes. We know that. We know that uh, the composition of the clay, this comes from archaeological chemistry. We know that the clay came from certain areas, from a central source, even if the terracottas were found hundreds of kilometers away, which means that there must have been a central political kingdom that controlled the, the usage of this clay, this ceremonial clay to make these terracottas, because it all came from one place. So these things like this can tell us the nature of a polity even without written or, or oral records. Now, it's really amazing how these things were found, because they were found on accident. In the 1920s, the British, who had colonized Nigeria, were uh, mining tin in the region. So they weren't doing archaeological work. They were mining tin. And through the process of mining this tin, they found uh, these uh, artifacts. And the first instinct was, of course, to sell them. Uh, but then a British-trained archaeologist that was working for the, the colonial administration, a guy named Bernard Fagg, he came, uh, was contacted about these terracottas in the 1940s. And then he actually said, well, we need to actually go in there and, and do some archaeological research because this might show us something uh, important about this region. Because prior to this, you know, the European history of Nigeria was basically this. Nothing happened in Nigeria until white people came. That was essentially the history. Or nothing happened in Nigeria until Arabs came. There was no real culture, nothing. People were living in the darkness that pervaded all of Africa. That was the idea. Uh, but Fag was a, a, a very interesting and, and honest white man. He was an honest white man. I can, I can say that. There was two honest white men that we'll talk about today. He was one of them. But he said, no, let's, let's excavate, excavate this area. Let's see. Let's do what they're doing in Egypt. Because it's one, one African place we know so much about is Egypt. Because there's been archaeology done in Egypt since the 1700s. Uh, so he said, let's, let's see what we can find. And they did, the more they dug, the more they found. And this place, uh, this area in central Nigeria still is under excavation and more things are still being found and still being stolen out of Africa, quite honestly. Uh, but very important, very important uh, archeological discovery in the 1940s. And since then more things have been discovered. That man, Bernard Fagg, would influence a student a Nigerian student uh, by the name of Amadou Lehman uh, Saroma. Saroma was a student who heard a lecture from Fag in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, and he decided he wanted to become an archaeologist. And he did so. He became actually Nigeria's first archaeologist. He went on to become a, a public servant uh, as well, and he writes a, a book about his life called Testing the Grit of Public Service. But before he got into the, the government, he was Nigeria's first trained archaeologist. And he worked with another very uh, honorable white fellow named Thurston Shaw. Thurston Shaw was another British uh, trained archaeologist. But instead of looking at the Nok culture, which is in central Nigeria, like north central Nigeria, he decided he wanted to explore what was in southeast Nigeria, in Igbo land. And through excavations, again, this was another accident as well. There was some mining being done and they found artifacts, but it was in the town of Ibo Ukwu. In Ibo Ukwu, he found the remains of the Nri Kingdom. Another major archaeological discovery that takes ironworking and uh, bronze making in Africa back even further back in time. It shows the importance of what the Ibo were doing in pre recorded history. And it connected oral traditions from the Igbo, which we'll talk about in two weeks, uh, to the archaeological evidence. So another important place. And his deputy on this archaeological expedition was Nigeria's first archaeologist, Lehman Saroma. So he worked with Thurston. And they also worked with the local population that were living in the area to help do this archaeological excavation, where they found uh, bronze sculptures such as the one that you see on the screen. And uh, Thurston Shaw wrote a book that's available. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to find, but you can still find some copies. An account of the archaeological discoveries in eastern Nigeria. This is the area that we're talking about. We're going to spend a lot more time on this area, on uh, Igbo history, in two weeks. The reason why I keep bringing up archaeology is this. It's really to impress upon us that this is work that needs to be done and controlled by African people. 
And we're, there's so much more that we can learn about Nigerian history through archaeology. But the problem is the government has to support it. And quite frankly, we got to get more African people ready to support this uh, initiatives like this. It's one of the big things that Nigerian archaeologists say is their problem is they just don't have the funding to do the work that they would like to do, which will help us reconstruct African history. And the more we know about African history, the more that we can better plan the African future. Because these people dealt with many of the same problems that we're dealing with, climate change, human conflict, uh, uh, societal conflict, I mean, between uh, inside of societies and between societies. So the more we learn from the past, the more lessons we learn from the past, the more we can practice Sankofa, taking those lessons, applying them to our present to make a better future. But you got some great young archaeologists in Nigeria that are still working around the city, the town of Ibo Ugu, and still finding tremendous archaeological discoveries. Um, and here's one of the techniques that they do. I just want to introduce you to some of the things that they do. And this is from their Facebook page. Uh, and you can follow them if you're interested. It's the Ibo Ukwu Archaeology Facebook page. Um, they say it's not all about pottery and other artifacts. The soil itself contains a variety of data that may greatly enhance our understanding of the ancient society and changes in the environment of Ibo Ukwu. All the excavated soil is served through small, uh, so for small artif artifacts that could be missed during excavation. Samples of the soil deposits are also collected for wet sieving in water-filled buckets. Using a combination of wire sieve and cotton mesh, this separates the heavy soils and artifacts, i.e. bones and beads, which sink to the bottom of the bucket, from small organic echo facts, such as seeds and charcoal. Why is that important? If you can look at the seeds, then you can know what people were eating. If charcoal is present, then you know people were probably smelting iron or bronze or making pottery or doing all these different types of things. Both the heavy residue and the light mesh are then dried before the contents can be separated, collected, cataloged for analysis. I'm bringing this up, not to bore you with the science of it, but to show you scientific techniques are continuing to be developed. And Nigeria, as well as other parts of Africa, are still underexplored. Think about the most explored part of Africa, archaeologically speaking. It's Egypt. There are still archaeological excavations going on in Egypt. To this, they keep finding stuff every year. They find, they make new discoveries. We found this new pharaoh's tomb. We found this, we found that. So if Egypt, which has been uh, under archaeological excavation in various places in Egypt since the 1700s, and they're still finding stuff, imagine what we can find to recount the history of the rest of Africa if we actually finance and support archaeological uh, excavation. And, and training our young people to become archaeologists. So much of our history is right there. that we And, and there will never be a, a, a statement uttered by people that say, well, there's no history in Africa. No, it's there. It just needs to be uh, recounted. And they're doing this right now, in 2022. So when we say what we know about Nigerian history, really it's what we know right now. It's not a finished product, process. So everything that you hear over the next four weeks, understand that this is just the beginning. We're nowhere near completion. We're just presenting to you what we know right now. Tomorrow, something could come out, led by folks like uh, this young man here, Dr. Kingsley Chimendu Dara Ojimba. Dr. Dara Ojimba is one of the youngest Nigerian archaeologists studying in Igbo land. And one of the things that he prides himself on is teaching young people, these are high school students, how to become archaeologists and the importance of the cultural heritage right in their own backyards. So he's developing a history of uh, Igbo land, taking it way back and bringing in the people of the community who were there in 2021 to help with the excavations. If the people themselves realize how important it is, the, the cultural heritage right under their feet, the cultural heritage of their ancestors, then not only does it benefit them culturally and pride, look at the pride of that young man there right in the front, doing an archaeological dig at, I don't know how old he is, he probably looks like he's about 10 years old. Not only does it and, uh, compel a sense of pride, but cultural heritage is also a moneymaker for people. 
How much money does uh, uh, Egypt bring in through tourism? How much money is made in those European museums where African artifacts are that they pay people to go see African artifacts? So you can uh, profit off of cultural heritage, not in an exploitative way, but in a way to showcase the work of our ancestors, to reconnect with that history, to retell that history. So there's, a, there's a, an economic reason for this as well. So we talked about archaeology in north central Nigeria with the nut culture. We talked about archaeology in the southeastern part of Nigeria in Igbo land with uh, Igbo Ukwu. In southwest Nigeria, one of the oldest places, and this place was also uh, studied by Bernard Fagg as well, the, the, the archaeologist, British archaeologist as well, and that's the city of Ilaife, the progenitor Tating city. I don't even know if progenitating is a word, but the progenitor city of the Yoruba kingdoms and city states that we're going to talk about next. So I'm going to turn it over to my co teacher, uh, Daniel Roberts III. He's going to introduce himself to you and tell you what we know about this part of Nigerian history from around 1000 to 1800 CE. So we'll listen to Daniel, then we'll have our first QA, then you'll listen to Daniel a little bit more. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. All right, good morning, everyone. Most of you are already familiar with um, who I am, but for anyone who might be new, my name is Daniel Roberts. I am an Africology major at Temple University, and I am uh, in my senior year right now, going to be graduating in May. And then from there, I have plans to continue my studies in graduate school. And today, I'm going to be talking about the Yoruba people who occupied much of modern day Nigeria. And in particular, we're going to be talking about their capital city of Ile Ife down here in the southern portion of the continent. I'm going to go ahead and open this. Okay, so. The Yoruba people, just as, a, um, as an introduction, are one of the largest ethnic groups in modern day Nigeria. They're actually the largest in Africa as a whole, but um, in Nigeria, they're one of three people who are more numerous than the rest. It's the Yoruba, the Igbo, and the Hausa. And the Yoruba are, as archeologists would like to term, one of the most urbanized peoples in all of African history. Most Yoruba towns are, are heavily fortified. They're protected by a lot of walls. Inside the wall, there's a king who um, wears the title Oba. And inside these um, enclosed fortifications rest up to half of the population of each given town. Um, the Yoruba were one of the largest ethnic groups sold into the transatlantic slave trade. So if you're an African-American or if you're in the Caribbean, it's very difficult. It's gonna be very hard for you to not have Yoruba in you somewhere. Um, so to get into it, Ile Ife is the spiritual and the ancestral capital of all of the Yoruba people. Um, the importance of this city cannot be understated. If Ile Ife is to the Yoruba what Mecca is to Muslims and what Jerusalem is to Christians. It's the oldest, the most important um, Yoruba state. It's at least a thousand years old, although it's possible that archaeological finds might prove it to be older. It's situated in southern Nigeria, and in Yoruba belief, this is where not only the Yoruba people at, um, as an ethnic group came from, but this is also where humanity as a whole came from. And that's all people, not just African or um, black people. Um, Ile Ife was, um, was known for producing a lot of skilled artisans who mastered such works as clay working, building floor pavements, building impluviums, and um, making metallurgy with the lost wax casting technique. And, um, it was this casting um, process that would produce artworks such as this mask over here, 
We're going to get more into that in a second, but just to explain what lost wax casting is, essentially the artist would make a mold of a person or of a figure they wanted to make a sculpture of, and they would make it out of wax. And then after that is made, you would pour molten metal inside of it, and then inside of that wax cast, the metal would harden and solidify, and then underneath you'd get um, you'd get some beautiful um, picture, um, beautiful sculptures like this. So just to um, talk about these works of art, we're going to watch a quick video that explains this a little bit more in depth. So far in this history of the world through things, we've encountered all kinds of objects, all elements, but not all. Uh, Daniel, you got to share your share that part of your screen. Uh, so click share screen again, and then click on the window where that YouTube video is playing. Um, okay. So exit full screen on on the on the presentation, and then. Uh, Click share screen again on your Zoom. There it is. So far in this history of the world through things, we've encountered all kinds of objects, all eloquent but not all particularly valuable or attractive. But today's object is, in any view, a great work of art. It's a head cast in brass. It's quite clearly the portrait of a person, but we don't know who. It's without question by a very great artist, but we don't know who. And it must have been made for a ceremony but we don't know what. What is certain is that the head is African, it's royal, and it epitomizes the great medieval civilizations of West Africa of about 700 years ago. It was one of a group of heads discovered in 1938 in the grounds of a palace in Ife, Nigeria, and they astonished the world with their beauty. They were immediately recognized as supreme documents of a culture that had left no written record and they embodied the history of an African kingdom that was one of the most advanced and urbanized of its day. The sculptures of Ife exploded European notions of the history of art, and they forced Europeans to rethink Africa's place in the cultural history of the world. Today, they play a key part in how Africans read their own narrative. A history of the world in a hundred objects. head. A bronze statue from Nigeria, probably 15th century. I'm in the Africa gallery looking at the Ife head, or rather he is looking at me. His head's a little smaller than life size, and made of brass which is now darkened with age. The shape of the face is an elegant oval covered with finely incised vertical lines, but it's a facial scarring so perfectly symmetrical that it contains rather than disturbs the features. He wears a crown, a high beaded diadem with a striking vertical plume projecting from the top, and that's still quite a lot of the original red paint. This is an object with extraordinary crispness, the alert gaze, the high curve of the cheek, the lips parted as though about to speak, all these are captured with absolute confidence. To grasp the structure of the face like this is possible only after long training and meticulous observation. There's no doubt that this represents a real person. But this is reality not just rendered, but transformed. The details of the face have been generalized and abstracted to give an impression of the pose.
So it's perhaps not surprising that nearly all of the Ife metal sculptures that we know, and there are only about 30, are heads. In 1938, an astonishing group of 13, including the one now at the British Museum, was dug up in the precincts of a royal palace at Ife. The quality of the brass casting was superb, and there could be no doubt now that this was a totally African tradition. The Illustrated London News of April the 8th, 1939, published the find, and in an extraordinary article, the writer, still using the racist language of the 1930s, recognizes that what he calls the Negro tradition, a word then associated with slavery and primitivism, must, with the eBay sculptures, now take its place in the canon of world art. Negro could never again be used in quite the same way. One does not have to be a connoisseur or an expert to appreciate the beauty of their modelling, their virility, their reposeful realism, their dignity and their simplicity. No Greek or Roman sculpture of the best periods, not Cellini, not Houdon, ever produced anything that made a more immediate appeal to the senses, or is more immediately satisfying to European ideas of proportion. It's hard to exaggerate what a profound reversal of prejudice and hierarchy this represented along with Greece and Rome, Florence and Paris, now stood Nigeria. If what an example of how things can change thought, then the impact of the heads in 1939 are, I think, as good as you'll find. Current research suggests that the heads that we know were all made over quite a short stretch of time, possibly in the middle of the 14th century. At that point, Ife had already for centuries been a leading political, economic and spiritual centre. It was a world of forest farming dominated by cities that developed in the lands west of the Niger River. And it was river systems that connected Ife to the regional trade networks of West Africa and to the great routes that carried ivory and gold across the Sahara to the Mediterranean coast. In return came metals that would make the Ife heads. The world of the Mediterranean had provided not the artists, as Corbain supposed, nearly the raw materials. Okay, so um, quite that's where I'm going to stop at for my halfway point, so we can um, open it up for Q&A now. Okay, yes, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand uh, or you can put it in the chat. And Daniel, I'll let you look in the chat. Uh, and if anybody has any questions from either myself or Daniel, uh, let me know. Uh, Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Morning, Mark. The more I come to these lectures, the more I'm, I'm questioning myself. What is civilization? Who is civilization? And why does it seem that the less civilized always gets stolen from the most? Yeah, it's a loaded term, civilization, because depending on who's defining it, uh, they'll define it in their own way. One of the markers used to be of civilization was that there was writing. But really, writing is just something you need for particular administrative purposes. It does, it's not a marker of intelligence or anything. Um, so it all depends on who's defining what's civilized, uh, because folks can look at the world that we live in now and people most people would say well we're very civilized now but the way that we're destroying the planet the way that we interact with each other is quite uncivilized compared to some people that have less technology uh or less of the technology less of the things that we recognize as technology and have uh, immaculate social relations uh so yeah it's all in the eye of the beholder but one of the things that we uh, know or we can observe uh from this uh recent history of African people is because of uh, the aggression of, of European colonization that, yeah, a lot of this stuff has been stolen, including other resources from Africa. But recognizing that now means we have a responsibility to return and recover those things, as well as to protect African resources, both human, uh, natural, and cultural from uh, being exploited by uh, folks uh, outside the continent and inside the continent as well. So with that recognition comes a responsibility. Uh, but yes, you're correct. Other questions or comments? Anything for me or Dan? Anything in the chat, Daniel? Um, there's nothing in the chat, but I do see a hand up. Um, 
Anamnu. I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, thanks. I don't know what it comes in when I join the group, so it depends on the device I'm using. Uh, this is uh, Lisa at your holiday. Or you know me. Um, question Are you going to be covering the spiritual aspect at all of this? Or, okay. Dan Daniel, uh, Daniel is. Daniel is. Okay. That's coming up right now. I think, right there. I'm not speaking out of turn. <laughs> Other questions? Anything else? All right. Oh, we got one from. Uh, uh, um, it looks like Lisa um, um, Liza is raising their hand. Okay. Um, do you think that are these skills made today, or this is like a skill that has been lost, so it's no longer you know made or practiced? Daniel? In Ile Ife in particular, I believe that practice has died out. At the time that these um, bronzes were found in the 1930s, that wasn't a practice that was still being employed. But there are other parts of Nigeria where, um, where artifacts like that are still being sculpted at present times. Is it as beautiful? Is it um, if I was to be honest, I would say that the works aren't as extravagant as they were in ancient times, but they're still pretty sophisticated. They're still very realistic and lifelike. Um, so I wouldn't say that the um, I wouldn't say that their quality has declined. I just don't. I wouldn't say that they're as nice looking as the older ones are. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, Charmaine? Hi, good morning. Um, I understood you to say that when they were making these, these, these sculptures, they used a wax mold and then they poured the, the metal, the molten metal inside? Yes. Um, there are videos that explain how to um, how that process works. I just left that out for the sake of time. Um, but it's it's a very complicated process. That's just a very simplified oversimplification of how that works. But yes, essentially you make a, a mold out of wax, and then you would pour molten metal into it. And then once it cools off, it's going to take the shape of the wax, and then you're going to um, pull the wax off, and then you're going to have a um, new metal mold underneath it. I just, I just think it's absolutely remarkable because I would have thought the wax would have melted, but we just have some incredible technologies in, in our community. I think it's amazing. And I, yeah, I, I, I saw the question in the chat. All of the videos, uh, in addition to the um, written sources that uh, we relied on for these lectures will be available on the course website, uh, which I'll send to all of you um, after uh, this session. And that's a living website, so more things will be added uh, as the weeks go on. Uh, so that will be available to you. Um, uh, I saw someone ask that question. All right. I don't think there's anything else. So uh, Daniel, go back, go back into it. Okay, so these are just some examples of some of the artifacts that would have been made in Ile Ife. At present, we don't entirely know exactly who these individuals are supposed to represent because Ile Ife was without writing. We have some speculation that these might have either been an Oni um, or the king of Ile Ife or that they might have been attendants. We have a stronger degree of certainty that images like this where the crown has this little um, projection at the top we believe that that is a representation of the orisha Oluku, who is the orisha or the deity of the um, sea but for all these other figures it's 
pretty much up to speculation right now. These are just some more examples of their bronzes. And they also made um, life life size sculptures as well. So they didn't just make heads, but they also made figurines as well. In addition to these, the ancestors of Ife um, lined their forests with pot shirts. And according to oral traditions, this practice was started by an Oni named Oluwo. And unlike most of the Onis of Ife, Oluwo was not a man, but a woman. And traditions tell us that she was out in the palace one day while it was raining, and she got her royal regalia covered in mud. And we learned that she was so angry about that, that she ordered that all of the important public and religious spaces would be lined with pot shirts so that your feet and that your clothes would be protected from getting dirt and getting mud on them. Frank Willett, who has done a lot of important archaeological work in Yorba land writes, the houses in Ife were paved inside with layers of pot shirts laid on edge, often arranged in very decorative patterns. Sometimes these are revealed in present day roads and footpaths and have proved to be extremely durable. And as he talks about in his book, Ife in um, Ife and its place in West African sculpture, he talks about how you can still find these um, pavements today and that you can drive over them like with cars and not break them. That's how tough and uh, durable they are. So these are just some pictures of what those pot shirts look like in Ife right now. Another form of technology that the ancestors of Ife had were in impluvium. These are a very um, common architectural form in Nigeria. And the way that it works is you would build out a house in the shape of a square or rectangle, and you wouldn't cover the roof. You'd leave a big hole in it. And so when it rains, the rainwater would be collected inside the house, and then that way you could store it for cooking or for bathing or for drinking. And so I'm just going to play a short video that talks about that and how um, and how they were built. Friend. would walk up to me and just be like, what the f is in your mug? And I would just tell them. These, which is why my channel exists in the first place. So moving on to Oblivion. A complubium is a square opening in the roof of the ancient Roman atrium towards which the roof sloped and through which the rain fell into the Oblivion. And then a peristyle is a colonnade surrounding a building or court. Ugh. Now, what's a colony? I'll just skip the formal definition for this one. It's basically just a bunch of columns supporting the roof of the building. Anyway, now to sum things up. An oblivion is a holding area like a tank to collect water. The atrium is a centrally located room that houses the oblivion. And the complubium is basically the same thing as the atrium, except it's an actual room and doesn't always include an oblivion. Then the peristyle, basically all the columns that support the entire structure. Now that that's out of the way, let's move on to the purpose and usage throughout the history of West Africa. So first and foremost, like their Roman counterparts, West African impluvium as the most basic of their uses was to collect rainwater. The collected water was then used for drinking, washing, cooking, cleaning, and bathing. This was a highly efficient and useful method for obtaining clean water in an era before indoor plumbing and sewage, and in my opinion, it could still be useful today. In fact, it actually is still useful today. The island country of Bermuda, for example, lacks many natural fresh water sources, with most of its water being brackish at best. As a result, all rooftops are mandated by law to be built of a white terraced design, which collects rainwater, which then drains into underground collection tanks. As a result of this, all Bermudian buildings effectively have their own free and self-sustaining water supplies. This is basically the same way that the traditional West African Oblivion work. They use the natural slope of a rooftop to direct water into a collection basin 
or several collection pieces. The Jola people of what is now the modern-day country of Senegal still build their homes this way in some areas. Their vernacular architecture typically consists of a house built in a circular arrangement like a ring with a circular courtyard in the middle. All rooms of the house encircle this central communal courtyard or depluvium. The roof then effectively funnels all of the rainwater into the middle courtyard where it is then deposited into several collection pots arranged around the edges. Yoruba and Edo compounds are more or less the same, only in more quadrangular forms. The Ashanti also had homes in a similar layout, but unfortunately I was unable to find any indication whatsoever that they incorporated the pluvium into their architecture. However, it is worth mentioning that in the late 19th century, English traveler Edward Bowditch visited the Ashanti capital of Kumasi and remarked with astonishment when he discovered that many of the Ashanti traditional buildings had indoor toilets located on their second floors and were flushed with buckets of boiling water. So back to the impluvium. The capital city of the Benin Kingdom had a system of sunken impluvium in which the rainwater that wasn't collected for use would drain into the house via underground channels, which were unseen as they were covered by walkways. They were quite literally an air conditioning system, as they brought in cooler air and cooled out hot air as they entered and exited the building, respectively. These channels typically flowed underneath raised alcoves of clay that were used for sleeping, sitting, and additional storage. In addition to this water cooling system, the construction of the house itself aided in the process of cooling. Mud or adobe brick is a poor conductor of heat, which is why it was also frequently used around the world for heat-related tasks such as cooking, stoves, and furnaces, in which the opposite effect was accomplished, with the heat being trapped on the inside of the mud utilities. In addition to this, Yoruba and Edo houses featured no windows at all that would otherwise let in the sun or hot air from the outside. While I could not find any concrete info on what happened after the channels of water left the house, it is likely they just simply flowed into some sort of gully system. According to an article published by The Guardian on March 18, 2016, the channels in Benin would actually have flowed into another sunken oblivion system that ran underground along the course of the main streets. Annoyingly enough, they never cited any of their sources, and nevertheless, with or without the latter part of this description, this was still an incredibly useful and efficient way of managing water for a city built in an area that averages 100 inches of rain annually. So lastly, we're going to cover a part of Africa that's history. Okay, so the rest of that video is about um, other unrelated things, so we're going to go back to the um, presentation now. Okay, so the um, to get to the to the good stuff. So there are a lot of different city states in both Nigeria and the Benin Republic that say that they came from Ile Ife, and all of them tell us the same general story. They say that Odudua was the oldest ancestor that they can trace the lineages back to, and that he was the sitting only at the time of this royal migration. Some stories say that there were seven princes who migrated from Ile Ife. Others say there were 16. But they all agree that they um, that the sons and grandsons of Ududu all met at a place called Irajero, which in Yoruba means the place of conference or the place of convention. And it was from there that they all got crowned. After they, were, um, they received their crowns and performed the necessary rites for kingship, they all let it um, led their own delegations consisting of priests, um, warriors, chieftains, and commoners. And they migrated in every direction from Ile Northwest, east and, um, east and South to found their own dynasties. Um, and what I think is particularly interesting is that even after they left Ile Ife, they still had an undying loyalty to that city and continue to recognize it to this day as their ancestral capital. They, um, there was relatively little infighting among the world. And the reason for this is that they practiced
the audio wasn't on. So everything I just said, no one heard. <laughs> I was going to say thank you for that. Um, and that takes us to the right where we're going to start next week, because I know uh, next week we will be looking at the development of a lot of those kingdoms and the history of those kingdoms that came out of Ila Ife. Um, and as we're talking about this political history, we should understand and anticipating a little bit about what uh, we're going to get into next week is that there's also spiritual dimensions to a lot of this, because as these Yoruba city states spread and then as folks even went across the ocean during the transatlantic slave trade. Ida Ife maintains itself as not only a political center, but also a spiritual center. Like Daniel mentioned, it's the place that the Yoruba believed the world was created from. It's the place that the, uh, uh, depending on the story that you hear, it's either Oduduwa or Abatala comes down from heaven. Uh, where there's a, an entire creation story. Wait. I don't want to anticipate. Daniel, are you going to talk about that next week? I don't think I'll talk about that specifically. Okay, so um, essentially what you have, and I might get the story, the details a little bit up, but the creator God, Odumare of the Yoruba, task, depending on who you, which version of this that you hear, sometimes it's a duduwa, sometimes it's a batala, with the task of going down into the watery void uh, and creating land and then creating people on that land. And the land that he creates, uh, he brings with him from heaven, comes down on the chain from heaven with a five-toed hen, a chameleon, and uh, uh, depending on the, wh which version you hear, uh, something to create land. He puts the land on the watery void and he puts down the hen and the hen scatters the land which creates the land for the entire world. Then the chameleon is tasked with going on the land to making sure that it's steady and you know can be cultivated and people can live on it because chameleons are incredibly careful if you ever watch a chameleon walk to make sure it's steady. Uh, then as the story goes on, particularly usually with Abatala, uh, who is a deity of peace, but he also had a tendency to uh, have a little too much palm wine. He gets drunk in the process of crafting human beings out of clay. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we get uh, uh, folks that uh, are differently able uh, because of uh, about the lot of drinking. And so that task of creation is then taken up by, uh, depending again on uh, which version you hear, some is uh, due to wise, some is other folks, and finish that task of creation. But all of this happens. The center point for all this action is Ila Ife. So as Eden is for the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, religions, Ila Ife is for uh, uh, the Yoruba traditions. Uh, so there's that dynamic to it as well. And a lot of the names that we will mention and the places that we mention are prominent places in the theologies that emerge from uh, Yoruba spirituality, theologies that exist both in Nigeria as well as in the diaspora. So uh, really important to know, this is, again, this is a seminar to give you just the introduction to this information. But after, after each week, I'm going to encourage you to not only use our course website, but also get information on your own. So we'll close it there today um, and open it up for any questions that folks or comments or things that the people want to add, because we're not going to sit here and pretend that we know everything. So if there's folks that have information that they want to share, please share. Uh, resources that people want to share, please share. So uh, let's, uh, let's take maybe two recorded questions. Then we'll turn off the recording for any open discussion. So does anyone have a question? Dan, you see anything in the chat? Uh, and, and if you want to uh, raise your hand, ask your question, you can do so as well. So you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Any questions, comments, or concerns that people don't mind being recorded? Maybe we'll take two recorded ones. Anything in the chat, Daniel? Um, I don't see anything. All right. All right. Nobody wants this. That's fine. So we'll start next week uh, with, with, with week two, and uh, I'll see you all then. Thank you for joining us today. All right. So uh, can we turn the recording off? All right. Any questions or comments that folks have that they didn't want to be recorded? 
anything. If not, we can, are we? There is a question. Okay. Just put in the chat. What does it say? Because I can't read it. As we continue to learn how different groups excluded other groups throughout the history, even when the excluded people have much um, to offer and contribute to the common practices, what is our path to peace when attempting to reconcile human behaviors and history? <laughs> That's a big question. I, I I don't have the complete answer. I wish I did, uh, but I don't know. Um, but one thing I can say is part of the process to get the answer to that question is by continuing to learn this history and not just the African history, but history of peoples all over the world so we can find out what people knew, what answers that they provided to some of the problems that we still have, and then sharing that information in a humble way. I think that's a step in that direction toward answering that question. Because maybe, I always think that maybe there's a human group, maybe there's a human history uh, of, of folks that have a lot of these answers that can lead us to peace. Um, but we don't know that because of our own chauvinism, our own uh, blinders to other people's history. So it's important for us to always be humble, keep an open mind, learn these things, and then not only learn them, but share them and share them with more people other than just folks that are in the university, so on and so forth. Um, so I wish I had the answer to that. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that. Mr. Thomas, go ahead. I'm just wondering if that does not go back to the question that was raised some time, some time ago about, about African sociality. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think it does, it connects. Um, we need to do a better job, particularly as African people, of learning our own sociology, learning how we should, learning on ways of interacting with each other, um, and scientifically learn it so that we can apply it. Uh, I think that's key. I would agree with that, Mr. Thomas. Any other questions or comments before we close out today? I don't see any. All right, I'll make one announcement. Um, uh, and again, this is also brought to you by Jaku Combat. Uh, so we have a new program that's starting called the uh, uh, Black Young Black Business Initiative for young people. Really, it's a wide range from 15 to 30 who are interested in learning how to start businesses to, uh, to get uh, some information and resources. That is starting in October, and they're taking applications. I will, uh, next week, I'll put the link to the applications in the, in the chat. So if folks know young people that are interested in business that want to get that expertise, that is starting. I'm not involved, I'm not in charge of that, but uh, we have a brother named Joseph who runs that program, who's going to uh, uh, really kick that in high gear in October. So that's starting up. So we'll give you more information about that. Did something else come up in the chat, Daniel, or is that just uh, a remark? Um, that was just somebody saying thank you. Okay, so thank all of you. So we'll stop for the day. I'll see you all next week. Uh, if you're watching, well, I think we've turned off the recording, but uh, if this is on YouTube, Facebook, we'll see you all next week as well, too. All right. Hey, Clyde, can you stay on for a few more seconds? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely.